Body image starts developing in early childhood and the relationship we all have with our bodies and appearance is one of the most significant, long lasting and complex relationships we will ever have. And the online world, well, it doesn't always help things. Recent research has shown that 58% of 19 to 30 year olds compare themselves to people on social media, with 48% of those people reporting dissatisfaction with their appearance. As we've seen across the media recently, social media platforms themselves also know of the negative implications they can have, specifically when it comes to our young minds. Reflecting on these statistics, we wanted to ask the question, how are our young people really holding up? And more importantly, how can we help them develop solid self-worth no matter what platform or skin they're in? Now, my first step today is speaking to the Butterfly Foundation. They're a national charity and Australia's leading experts when it comes to supporting people with body dissatisfaction and eating disorder issues. I want to know from them what the source and reasoning is behind body dissatisfaction. I want to cut through the noise and find out what actually contributes and, of course, the really important warning signs we all need to look out for. I wanted to ask a couple of questions. And the first one that I wanted to ask was, I guess, around how, you know, body image is formed. So we know that it's formed by thoughts, feelings, attitudes and beliefs uh, that we have about our bodies and the way that we look. How do you think that social media impacts that for young people today? There's lots of benefits from social media. So it's not in itself a, a bad thing. But the research does clearly point to the fact that, um, particularly image-based platforms do impact young people's um, body dissatisfaction. And it's doing that in kind of two ways. One, because um, social media promotes those appearance ideals, which are uh, very narrow and unrealistic and about 95% of us could never really achieve naturally on our own. And the other thing that social media does is it really drives those appearance components. Mm -hmm. And in the past, you know, with traditional media, you would compare yourselves to maybe a celebrity in a magazine or a sports star or a movie star. But what social media allows you to do so easily is to compare yourself with people that are very like you. Both online and offline, there is an extreme pressure to be perfect. And I think young people are really, really feeling this um, at the moment. And I would also add to that there that there is a strong feeling of self-optimization coming through on these platforms um, and this general sense that young people need to improve themselves in order to be better. Um, we're seeing this through things such as extreme weight loss um, con pieces of content, extreme dieting pieces of content, um, even things like sharing uh, beauty routines and skincare routines to essentially improve the way that you look and I think it's really important taking that focus that seems to be rife on social media off how you look and placing it on what your body can do rather than what it looks like. So we know that as you said females are at a higher risk of body dissatisfaction People that are living in larger bodies are at risk, not because of their inherent body size, but because of the weights, uh, stigma and discrimination that they are generally often on the receiving end of. We know that girls and boys, um, the timing of puberty is really important in terms of their body satisfaction so that girls that go through puberty early and boys that go through puberty later are at a higher risk of body dissatisfaction. And, and on top of that, we've got all the um, individual influences. So there are certain personality types that lend themselves to being more dissatisfied. So people that are very perfectionistic in their thinking or um, high achievers or someone who holds very high standards for themselves, somebody that internalizes those messages that we get in society. So somebody who really does relate their worth to those appearance ideals. 
Traditionally, the research around body image issues and eating disorders more broadly has been quite heavily focused on the stereotype um, mm -hmm. that exists, being that only young white females experience these issues. So I'm really excited to see the research expanding to explore groups um, broad, broader than young females, such as people um, from the LGBTQIA plus community, our First Nations community, and also um, those from a culturally and linguistically diverse background, because we know that eating disorders and body image issues don't discriminate and that they can affect anybody of any ethnicity, sexuality, gender, socioeconomic background. Mm -hmm. um, and often these communities that are more marginalised experience them in really unique and differing ways. Mm -hmm. For example, we know that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people may experience these issues as a result of intergenerational trauma. Um, we know that people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds um, may, experience, may experience them as a coping mechanism due to, um, you know, extremely traumatic situations, which has led them to come to Australia. Um, and it's really important that we communicate information about these issues to them in their own languages um, and, and in, an, in a culturally appropriate way. Um, so that's why we're really dedicated to ensuring that we have information available in different languages on our website, for example. We need to be really careful of shifting the blame um, of body image issues solely onto social media organisations. Because if you take social media away, things like fat phobia, things like weight stigma, things like appearance-based teasing still exist. Mm -hmm. So it's really systemic and we need to look more broadly. And even teachers and parents need to be thinking about the way that they're talking to their young people in the home and the classroom environment. The idea of young people seeking perfection and the permanency of the role of the internet in their lives were really interesting and important concepts raised by Helen and Alex. I wanted to dive more deeply into this, so I'm going to speak to Teodora Pavkovich. She's a psychologist and lead cyber safety and digital wellness expert at LineWise. I'm going to get her to add her perspective. The Butterfly Foundation discussed um, some pretty interesting reports that body image disorders have been exacerbated due to increased use of video calls in remote learning environments. Um, they say that young people who are used to only sharing filtered versions of, versions of themselves are feeling really self-conscious uh, by constantly looking at themselves uh, on video all day. And they also said that kids were concerned about peer perceptions because they weren't able to filter themselves in a way that they ordinarily would. So what are your thoughts on this? And secondly, what can we do about it other than just, you know, having those video off opportunities? Right, right. Well, I mean, the, the video off opportunities are really important. They're a little bit like a just kind of a plaster. So kind of in the moment, how can we uh, sort of find a very quick solution to to alleviate some of that stress, perhaps some of that anxiety that that kids are experiencing. It is a, a pretty worrying trend. And it's interesting that it's kind of come up in some of this research in Australia, we are seeing the same things um, in the US and, and probably kind of all across the world where children have um, spent a lot of time in, in virtual learning, spend a lot of time, uh, you know, behind closed doors and, and using their devices a lot. So even here in the US, um, some of these reports are coming out that, you know, some of the kids who are now going back to school in person are feeling really anxious to do that because they've gained some weight um, during, during COVID, which, you know, a lot of us have. And so they're really nervous around that perception of, you know, what are other kids going to say or what are they going to do? How are their teachers going to respond to that? So, um, so, so that is happening across the board. Kids are nervous about it when it comes to video calls. They're also nervous about it um, as they kind of return to school in person as well. Body hyper-awareness um, and the desire, I guess, to change our appearance in one way or another has been around for hundreds, possibly thousands of years. Why yeah. can't people just be happy with the skin they're in? 
Oh, that's such a big question. <laughs> that, that's an amazing question. I think we should kind of organize a whole event around getting tons of different people uh, giving their ideas on that and answering that question. I think at the very kind of um, sort of foundational basic level, I think it does come back to us being incredibly social um, animals and, and social creatures. And we've, we've constantly used that kind of social comparison to kind of figure out where we're at um, and, and figure out, do we need to change something? Do we need to kind of obtain more resources or better resources in order to kind of ensure our chance of survival? So, so I think, you know, if you were to, to kind of rewind all the way back to the cave people, you know, back then you were looking at, oh, they have a bigger cave than I do, which means, you know, they can fit more of their family into it. So I need to work towards getting whatever, you know, cave they had. Or, uh, you know, if you were living in particularly cold parts of the planet, you wanted to have a little bit more of that insulation on you. Um, I'm talking about your body and be a little bit bigger, perhaps in order to conserve heat. So you'd think, you know, if you saw another person, um, another human who was bigger than you, you think, oh, I need to pile up a little bit as well in order to kind of survive the winter. I do think basically it's, a, it's, it's been a survival mechanism for us. Life has gotten incredibly complicated now where we look to other people for things that we perhaps should and, and shouldn't as well. And, and we try to kind of emulate that and, and we try to imitate that. And I think, again, the, the bottom line is we're also observing how other people react to other people. And if we see that there's a particular trend or a particular body shape that's drawing a lot of attention from, from other people, um, we of course want to kind of bask in that sunshine of attention as well. And that's perfectly human and, it, and it's completely normal. I do think it's important that we kind of address this in more than just that kind of quick fix sort of band-aid um, mm -hmm. approach and, and think about what are some of the ways that we can, I think, first of all, kind of normalize this for them. Um, and, and just help them understand that this has happened to all of us. Um, even us adults have, have struggled with kind of maintaining our weight, healthy eating, or perhaps show them some instances where adults are speaking about this as well and how hard it's been for them to, to kind of um, adapt and, and to maybe stay healthy during COVID and, and to now go back to being healthy as we're kind of emerging uh, from this pandemic it would be really useful. So, so kind of normalizing it for them to begin with. I would say to parents to be extremely mindful of the way that you're talking about yourself, your appearance, your weight and shape in front of your children because your children are your greatest imitators and you really do need to give them something great to imitate. Um, that's not to say that you're not doing a great job <laughs> and that's not to say to be harsh on yourself but just be really aware and careful of what you're saying to your young people. I think as well, it's really important to talk to people under the age of 13, because I don't think that there's enough information given to them to prepare them to go onto social media. I mean, unfortunately, I think there's probably loopholes that exist, meaning that people under the age of 13 are on those platforms already, which is a whole nother conversation. But I really do think it's important for parents to sit down and prepare them almost as if they were preparing them to go to high school, that they prepare them to um, endeavour into the world of social media and give them some of that social media literacy that is so needed. So obviously Butterfly is an organisation that can provide direct support into schools, um, both for teachers and directly to young people. Uh, we have uh, a number of resources ourselves. One of them is called Reset, and that's a conversation about boys' body image. And that's a great resource for educators who want to um, have a conversation both with males and uh, co-ed groups around the issues specifically that boys face. There is also some really great content provided by the Dove Self-Esteem Project, which is a global initiative that mainly focuses on girls and self-esteem and body image. And we are, Butterfly is the partner organisation for Dove Self-Esteem Project in Australia. And they have a great website with lots of resources, particularly one called Confident Me, which is for 11 to 13 year olds. And that's really does go into uh, appearance ideals and the impact of media 
of our feelings about our bodies. So that's a really great resource that teachers can uh, pick up and use very easily. And then there's also Media Smart, which is from Binders University, which is a kind of um, an eight week program, media literacy program. So those are the sorts of resources that I would suggest schools access. Um, Butterfly also has a resource called Free to Be, which includes um, lesson plans and content from uh, year three through to year 12. And of course, Butterfly Body Bright, our new program for primary schools, talks, uh, one of the modules is about helping young people be resilient to media messaging. I love some of the concepts that were raised today, especially the timely reminder of the long-term existence of cultural and historical experiences of body dissatisfaction and our struggle with that aspirational mindset paradigm over the ages. Whether it's foot binding or the colour of our skin, there's always something that makes us feel imperfect simply because it's different to what we have and the response it provokes in other people as well. Despite the recent leaked report stating that social media platforms contribute negatively to body image, for kids and adults alike, I actually think it's more important to understand that this isn't just a technology or social media issue. It's not even a new issue. This is a concept we all grapple with regardless of the format it's delivered in. Understanding that technology, while it definitely plays a role, is just a vehicle, is actually really empowering. What we allow to fuel that vehicle is ours to work on. We each have the power in every conversation to shape young people's perspectives when it comes to the beauty story they tell themselves. It's in the language we use, how we see others, and the critical thinking we each need to apply to the current narrative perpetuated by online environments and the larger media. They say the greatest act of rebellion is liking yourself in a society that profits from your self-doubt. In schools and in homes, we each have the power to spark a movement through early intervention and education. Now that is a conversation worth starting today.